Here at Everyday Driver, we work hard to show you cars in amazing locations. Sometimes, though, the weather just works against us. Over the course of this shoot, we had 60 degrees clear and sunny, and 30 degrees with snow. And the car had summer high-performance tires. So the result is probably the slickest, dirtiest Corvette review you'll ever see. There's so much heritage riding on the next generation of the Corvette that it had to be done right. Everybody is polarized about this car. I wasn't convinced at first. This car has a lot of presence, and once you see it in person, it becomes striking. Very aggressive styling. It almost looks like it's made out of origami in some places. I mean, there are a ton of very sharp creases throughout this entire car. There are nine different styling creases on the hood. But follow these lines around the car. There's beautiful sculpting and surface transitions on this car. And that takes us to the rear taillights. At first, I was kind of thinking, uh-oh, they didn't put the traditional round lights in the back. The story goes that when Chevy was designing the revised retro Camaro, they were told to make the Camaro taillights look like the C6 Corvette. Well, now it looks like somebody told the person styling the Corvette to make the taillights look like the chopped versions off of the retro Camaro. I don't think it's a bad thing to go away from the all circular tail lights. I mean, this is such a new redesign of the car. Why not take the lights with it? Everybody that still wants those round tail lights is stuck in the past, and that's not where this car is going. The more I look at this car, the more I'm impressed by it. The only thing I really don't like is this chrome strip in the front fascia. It makes this car look like it's wearing a retainer. It has heritage, it has history, but GM's looking forward and the interior reflects that. Of course, one of the most common critiques of the Corvette has always been the interior. And amazingly, Chevy has really listened here. The interior has to be new and good, but it's gotta be intuitive and it just needs to work and be well screwed together. If you look at this shape that starts down at the door and goes over the top of the instrument panel and all the way over to the passenger side, this smacks a little bit of R8 and that's perfectly okay with me. Audi does some of the best interiors, and stylistically, this is a cockpit. Overall, the materials in here are remarkably improved. One of the only places it seems to reference the plastic of old is the piece around the nav screen and that frames the gauges. That actually is still one big piece of Chevy plastic, but otherwise, there's of course a touchscreen menu with good navigation and integration with your phone, and all the stuff you've come to expect is also in this interior. Pretty much anything you'd like to see, this center gauge will show you, and the heads-up display duplicates almost all of it. May I just say, finally, the seats are good. They did well. They paid attention to a lot of criticisms. The amount of features that are on this car. There's no longer an excuse here. This is absolutely a fifty to sixty thousand dollar car interior. The car we're driving has the Z51, the performance package, and this is something you absolutely have to get. It includes the availability of the magnetic ride suspension it's got the dry sump oil system, the electronic differential, larger slotted brake rotors. This is the one you have to have, but get this, it doesn't add a whole lot to the bottom line, to the price of this car. Why would you buy a Corvette without this performance package? Interestingly, this is just the base Corvette. This is not any special variation, which means the prices start about $52,000 and go up. Now, I, like you, have been reading a lot of things up to this point about the new C7. I've been reading about how good it is, and I gotta be honest, I've been a bit skeptical. We have driven a lot of variations of the C6. The only one we did a review of for the show was the ZR1, but this is an all-new Corvette. For example, this is a carbon fiber roof, a carbon fiber hood. They've used some of the carbon fiber prowess that they gained making the ZR1 in making the C7. It's not that the C7 is so much lighter than the prior C6 generation. It's how it manages that weight. As a matter of fact, when I turn in, I'm still expecting that heavy front corner weight to just kind of reveal itself, and it never has on this car. 
From the first time I got in it, it's felt lighter and smaller than any prior Corvette I've ever driven. The performance of the C6 was always impressive, but it continued to feel like a large car. The C7 somehow doesn't. Anytime I throw this car through corners, I'm amazed at how small and light it feels. It is hundreds of pounds lighter than both the ZL1 Camaro and the GT500. And it's similar in weight to the current 911. Now the C7 has a variable ratio power steering. And at first, it felt too light. But this car grips so hard through the corners, I cannot believe it. You throw it in and expect it to come loose, and it doesn't. Now, granted, some of that is the really intelligent traction control system. You certainly can turn the systems off and get it as loose as you'd like. You're going to want to become a better driver. It's coaxing you to become a better driver, but it's not going to do it for you. All the tools are there, though. I have to admit, I'm used to a little bit more information in the steering wheel. I mean, so many cars have gone to variable electric steering that it's just becoming commonplace now. And the same things are true here as everywhere else, and that is there's not a lot of tire information. This has a smaller steering wheel, which makes you feel more involved in the driving experience. And the steering ratio is tighter than a Honda S2000. The weight is good, and it's actually very precise. I cannot believe how well this car tracks to the corners. I didn't think GM could build a precision instrument, and they have. This car corners so flat. It is available with a similar magnetic shock system that, of course, was in the ZR1, is also now in the ZL1, and the ATS, and the CTS. I mean, GM has figured that out well. Body movement is so well controlled. <laughs> I'm having fun already. God, that's a good noise. And then there's the engine. If there was ever an argument that you cannot drive a stat sheet, it is the C7 Corvette. On paper, it doesn't look like it makes that much power, but this thing is fast. Think about this. The ZL1 Camaro has 100 more horsepower than this. The GT500 has 200 more horsepower than this. But when you drive it, it's as fast as those. It's every bit as fast as the 911, but the horsepower number doesn't seem that grand. This car puts its power down so well, it feels like it's got far more than it does. This seven-speed transmission feels so well matched into the power that this makes. And this seven-speed gearbox can allow you to go 80 miles an hour in fourth at about 3,500. Or you can go 80 miles an hour in seventh at 1,600. The engine's barely turning over. Now this C7 also has something called rev match. It uses the steering wheel from the automatic transmission cars. They've got these leftover paddles. Why? Well, because it's a parts bin steering wheel. They didn't want to design two steering wheels, so they designed one with paddles, and the manual went, huh, what do you do with the paddles? Oh, we'll make a rev match. So if the gear indicator is white, that means it's off. But if it turns amber, you just pull the switch, and it turns it on. It smooths your shifts both up and down. In fact, it's kind of keeps you from learning the clutch as well as you could, because once you use it a few times, it really is great. I love to heel toe, but it's really hard to argue with what a good job this system does, especially if you were on a track. Yeah, it's, it's gonna make you lazy. Here's the thing, the pedals are already so well placed. You need to start learning yourself. You need to do it yourself. So welcome to our debate. Before the press car even showed up, we've been talking about Corvette's signature thing as just a whole lot of performance for your money. The GT500 Mustang, the ZL1 Camaro, the Cayman S, and the Porsche 911. All these cars, the base price is more than the Corvette. And with the GTR now being well over 100 grand if you buy a new one of those, 
even the Viper is now a $100,000 automobile. The Corvette's kind of left in a class by itself. All of its competition is left. I can no longer tell you in good faith to go buy a 911 because they're now a hundred grand. They're brilliant and I love them, but after driving this, the only thing I can liken that to are the intangibles. You're just a Porsche guy like me and you just want the Porsche, but... I don't think anybody buying a 911 is really tempted by the Corvette and vice versa. I mean, they really are different car buyers. Now the 911 still feels more refined than this, but again, it's almost twice as expensive. Think of it this way, the 911 is like an Olympic decathlete. It does everything really, really well. This car is more like a CrossFit champion. Both of them are amazingly versatile athletes. They just go about it a little bit different. And as I drive this, I'm struck by the fact that the Corvette may be the best performance bargain on the market right now. I'm not suggesting 60 grand isn't a good amount of money, but you're 40 to 50 grand less than everything this is supposed to compete with. That's the debate. That's what we're endlessly debating. It's also very debatable that there's other cars that are more fun to drive. I'm not a Corvette guy. I never have been. And this is the first car I would consider owning. And I say consider because, yeah, I'm, I'm a Porsche guy at heart, but that's not an excuse. That's not an argument. You got me. <laughs> the 911 is your high class and probably high maintenance girlfriend. I mean, you can go anywhere and be proud to be with her. The Corvette is a little dirtier and that's okay. You want something with more power? Great, you're gonna pay more for it. You want something better handling? Sure, you're gonna pay more. Why would you do that when you can get such a brilliant car? The gauntlet has been thrown and I cannot tell you why you shouldn't buy a Corvette. I'm not really a Corvette guy. I like them. I've never lusted after them. That changes with the C7. What you get for this price, everything they've given you on this car, I can't believe it, but I really want one.